Good morning and happy Sabbath. This morning we have someone very special with us. This is Pastor Philip Milosavlovich. Good morning. Good morning. Many of you already know him, but Pastor Philip, something really special happened last week down in San Bernardino. It did, what yeah. What happened? We did an event called King's Table this last uh, Saturday night, and we had a beautiful, beautiful banquet style um, feast for over 115 people suffering with homelessness. Uh, this season, Amazing. and we had over 250 volunteers. So it was a really special event. We had event. more volunteers we than did. actual people we there. We did. What wow. was really cool was we had individuals who were literally serving each uh, person at a table. So they didn't have to get up and do anything. Uh, Serve with fancy silverware and plates and drinks. It was really a special time. Wow. So how long were you there? Was it just a meal or did you have a program as we well? We had a beautiful concert right before that actually. So for about an hour, we had various artists from our local community that came out. Um, and then we had the dinner after that. That's wonderful. And you can see all of this and more on the bridge, which will be coming up. I'm not exactly sure which episode it will be on, but you'll want to stay tuned and check that out. Yeah. We really appreciate what you do uh, with the Praxis ministry. It's wonderful, the Thank difference you. that you're making. Praise God. Yes. Now, tonight is something that all of you have been waiting for. That is the Christmas concert. There are a couple of things that we need to let you know. If you are coming to the four o'clock concert, doors open at 3.30. If you are coming to the 6.30 concert, we will be opening the doors at six o'clock. We're letting you know that because the doors will be closed. We need to make sure that everyone exits from the first concert before we can let anyone in for the second concert. So just so that you're aware of that. Now, during this holiday uh, series, we are doing a book exchange. And so each week you can come in with one of your favorite books that's built up your faith and then grab a book. Today I wanna to just share with you really quickly one of my favorites called Crazy Love by Francis Chan, a story of his journey with Christ and why faith matters and needs to be practically lived out. So I'll leave a copy there in the back. So hope you can grab that one if you're here, uh, but otherwise bring your favorite and take one as well. We've been having a lot of fun with that, actually. Yeah. So again, that is out in the foyer. There's a big table there. Leave one and take one. And then next week, December the 21st at 4.30, will be our special Christmas Vespers, Festival of Lessons and Carols. We hope that you come out to join us. And if you'd like more information, you can always check out our website, uh, lluc.org, or even take a look at our app and even Roku Station where you can catch more media that you love so much. We're glad that you're all here worshiping with us. Have a wonderful Sabbath day. See ya.
we have just been blessed with a wonderful sample of the music here at University Church today. And those of you who were here during the 1030 hour got an unusual blessing. It was inspiring from start to finish. And on behalf of those of you who were here with Betsy and me, I want to say for all of us a big thank you to Amy Leukert for the hard work she obviously invested with 120 children who were up here for music and other displays of their talent, and all of it focused on our gratitude for this special season. And thinking of the season, uh, I have lots of good weeks during a year, but a couple of weeks at this time of year are extra special for me. And, and I've been doing a little monitoring just in the past week. There seems to be more smiles on people's faces during this season of the year. And the bright, merry Christmas that people whom I didn't expect to hear from extend to us as we get to greet. So I'm just so blessed with this time of year, and I know you are as well. Today at University Church is a very special day because already you've heard the announcement about the Christmas concert this afternoon. You're in for a blessing there. And speaking of blessings, it's a blessing to have all of you here. And I know we have visitors from many places. How many visitors here today joining us this season? Right over here, I, here are more. You are particularly welcome with the Loma Linda University Church here today. And speaking of welcome, it extends to those of you who join us from near and far via television, the internet, however you connect with us. I want you to know we know you are a part of our family too. So thank you for joining us. And it is a blessing because as we learned in the program at 10.30 this morning, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ interrupted the sinful course of the universe to give us all hope from his birth until his second coming when we will unite together as his great family of faith. So I'm so grateful for this day. And remember the angels saying, holy, 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 and rejoiced with the glad tidings that Jesus has come. Good morning, church. Let's all stand up and sing There's a Song in the Air.
Let's bow our heads as we come to our Lord and King in prayer. Our dearest Father in heaven, Lord, it is true. We are smiling a little bit more this week. And the closer we get to the day that we remember you coming as Christ's child, it just gives us so much happiness and so much hope. Regardless of what we're going through, and many people here and watching via broadcast are dealing with some very significant things, whether it's illness, whether it's relationships or finances or work or just life in general, at this time of year, it sure is the greatest gift of all that regardless of what this world brings our way, that you brought us something greater, you brought us hope. And today we just celebrate in that hope and we want to worship you. We want to bring you all the praise that we have. We want to bring you all of our hopes and our dreams and our fears and lay them all at your feet because we know that your hopes and dreams are greater than any that we could ever come up with. Today we know that your Holy Spirit has accepted our invitation to come and be here and dwell among us. And so today we expect you to have a word for each of us something to let us know not only that you're alive and well but to let us know what you need us to do what you need us to hear and especially through randy's message today what you need us to do in order to make the change in the world at this christmas time that you need us to make as your people i just pray lord that at this time you'll help us to set aside all of our distractions because we want to receive from you the message that you have for us today and so lord come Give us ears to listen, give us eyes to see, and give us the mind of Christ, that beautiful Christ child who came so many years ago and not only changed our lives, but changed the world. And so today, Lord, we thank you, not only for coming, but for giving us so much more than we could ever have asked or imagined. And we pray this all in your precious name of Jesus. Amen. I am joined this morning by my dear friend, Dr. Edna May Loveless. She was the wife and the ministry partner to our senior pastor who served for 16 years, Dr. William Loveless. How many remember Dr. William Loveless? Oh yeah, we are among friends, Edna May. And we, uh, we gave Edna May a private tour of the new building and the room that bears her last name, William Loveless Fellowship Hall. But I wanted to ask Edna May on platform at, for our building highlight to ask her what she thought of the building and, and uh, her reflections on that. Edna May, thank you for being with us this morning. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. I represent a generation that's been around a long time. We think we have an awful lot to tell you. We have so much wisdom after all these years. But when I talk, Doug, with my friends, my peers, they are very supportive of this program. We want to see our children and our grandchildren blessed here. And we want this building to be both functional and classy. We need to have a good curbside appearance for, uh, right. with this new building. And I'm, uh, I'm just happy to be uh, sharing with you some of the things I've heard about it. Some people have said, what about this much space? What are we going to do with all of it? Let me remind you that when that temple was built in Jerusalem and Jesus was worshiping there, it, was, it contained courtyards and rooms that would fill 10 football fields today. It was a very busy and happy place. And those uh, courtyards had compartments in them. Each, each uh, corner of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the courtyard, thank you. And um, would you believe 
That's probably where Anna, the prophetess, was. That's probably where Jesus was when he was 12 years old, three years away from his parents. There must have been some hospitality going on there. Exactly. There's going to be hospitality here, too. We, that's one reason for the fellowship hall. We, um, I, I spent uh, 16 years listening to my husband <laughs> preach sermons here, a few hundred sermons, yes. and you, which you know, he said, nothing that happens on Sabbath morning in the church service is significant unless things are going on Amen. between the people in the pews. Amen. So I'm, I'm very pleased that we have the fellowship hall and all these other facilities that are going to brighten our days in the future. Uh, Ed May, I love your reflections, not only on your previous ministry, but on the, uh, on the new building and how it will serve the generations to come. Friends, we are looking forward to next Sabbath. December 21 is our special offering Sabbath. And you can watch the growth of that fund in our giving season in the bulletin. And we hope that you will make it a matter of prayer and bring your first fruits to the Lord for his house. Because after all, we build for his kingdom. For the offertory today, you are going to present the offertory in singing, Good Christians Now Rejoice. So please join. It is time to take up that lamb's offering. We're kind of short on space, so we reserved a few pews for you to sit right here after you've done that. So I want you to make sure you get all the way back in the corners on both sides, up in the balcony. If you're already up in the balcony, kids, you got a big job. I hear all the time, they won't take my money in the balcony. So please get all of it up there and come on down while we sing Away in a Manger.
yeah, come and sit in these front three rows right here. Or on the floor is fine too. Some of you are already making yourself at home. You can sit on the floor as well. That's not a problem. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, I know, so much money and you don't know what to do with it all, right? That's my problem. Yeah, thank you for laughing. <laughs> come on through, you can make it, you can make it. Excellent, excellent. Uh-oh, where did the bucket go? All right. Well, I don't know about you, but sometimes it is hard for me to forgive other people. Sometimes. You don't have that problem? Oh, good for you. Now, sometimes if it's not something that big of a deal, you know, like let's say I'm walking and I'm carrying something heavy and somebody like steps in front of me, I don't like throw it down and yell at him or anything like that. It's like, eh, it's no problem, no problem. It's not a big deal. But what if somebody does something that kind of hurts you, that makes you feel really bad? That's hard to forgive somebody, right? It is because it hurts so much. And sometimes we want to be angry. Mmm. Anybody ever felt like that? I know sometimes my daughters, I would ask them to apologize. Mmm. I don't want to apologize. I want to be angry with them. It's hard to let go of that hurt. But you're going to hear today that by us forgiving others, it makes us feel so much better inside, even though it's a very hard thing for us to do. So to help you remember that, I have a little gift for all of you to take back to your seats. It is a little bottle of disappearing ink. You're probably going to need your parents to help you out with this one. But you can take and dip something in the ink and write something on some paper, and it's all there, and then it just disappears like you're forgiving somebody for that bad thing that they did to you. And it's a fresh, clean piece of paper after that. So before I give you bottles of ink, I need you to raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I promise. I will not open it in church. I will only use it on paper. With mommy and daddy's help. All right, thank you. You can grab one of those bottles on your way back to your seat. to have the life that they bring listen to them promise and then watch them go back to their seats and break their promise so <laughs> truly it's a wonderful Sabbath day a wonderful day to worship God and we're delighted the kiddos are with us including this young man right here this is Noah you wondered why it was raining here we go Noah is coming to be given in dedication to Jesus today by Sharon and Sohail. Proud parents, delighted about the opportunity to be able to come to their church family and ask Jesus to bless little Noah in a very special way. Sharon's a nurse practitioner. Sohail is an attorney. They're both studying, deeply engaged in studying right now for professional kinds of exams. And somehow I have the feeling that Noah isn't studying and that he kind of has a tendency to <laughs> pull on mom and dad, which obviously they are delighted with. This is a family that loves to be together and loves the great outdoors, loves being outside in God's second book, the book of nature. They want to raise little Noah to know something about nature and all that it holds. So Noah, we're delighted that you're here with us today, having brought your family along with you, not just your parents, but I think there are other family members and friends of Noah's that are here, 
I'm not sure where everybody is, but I know where a few are. Would you stand right now if you're here to support the dedication of little Noah? There we go. Wonderful. Oh, all over the place people are standing. That's why even in the balcony. That's excellent. Okay, I think I found it here, Noah. I'm going to give that to Dad. You may be seated, but we're very pleased that you've joined us today. And I want to read something that Mom and Dad have written in terms of what's happening here today. They start with two Bible texts, one from Psalms, one from Jeremiah. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then the words to Jeremiah the prophet, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And now the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you with thanksgiving in our hearts and praise for the birth of our son Noah and the great joy and comfort he is to us. Thank you for the heritage and gift of children. We want to dedicate our precious son to you, Lord, and pray that you would give us the wisdom to bring him up to know and love you, the Lord Jesus, as his Savior. Protect him, we pray, from all forms of evils, and may he grow up to be a mighty man of God in the days to come. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now, Noah, Noah, we want you to grow up to be strong and healthy and follow the will of God. We hope you come to know of God's love for you and are surrounded by a loving, nurturing, nurturing caring environment that will help you grow and reach your full potential. We dedicate you, our child, to the service of God. Amen. You're being dedicated, Noah, not only here by mom and dad, but by a loving community, a community of which your parents are a part. In fact, your mom has been a lifelong part, a volunteer here, driving shuttle carts and such things. And it is in that kind of a community that Noah will be able to learn to know and to love Jesus. This act in which we engage today is not a nice idea that somebody in the church thought up to be able to offer something to parents. This is actually a very ancient act. It goes all the way back deep into the Old Testament, is expressed again in the New Testament, and is especially expressed in the life and the ministry of Jesus. When the moms crowded around them, him, despite the disciples trying to keep them away, and Jesus said, no, 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 no. Bring them here. Bring them to me, because of such as these is the kingdom of God. So that's what we come to do today, to ask the Spirit of God to bless Noah and his family in a special way. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray together. God of grace, it's always a joy to hold these little ones in our arms, to know that your hand of grace and power and goodness is on them through your Holy Spirit. We pray for Noah, Lord, that you would guide him all the days of his life. We pray for mom and dad, for all those who stood, for our church family. We want to be a place and a people where Jesus is seen, where the little ones are safe, and where they grow up to love and honor you. That's our prayer today as we dedicate Noah to you. In the name of Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, Noah. God bless you, Mom and Dad. And we look forward to seeing what Jesus will do in his life. Bless.
Our scripture this morning is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, through chapter 5, verse 2. You can also find it on page 1744 in your pew Bibles. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, for only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ and God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I believe I have an appointment this week here on the platform with one Lauren Karpenko. Is Lauren here? Ah, there you are, Lauren. Come right on up. I'm delighted to know that you're here. That makes things a lot easier for me. So come right on up, Lauren. Now, for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, I had an appointment here with Lauren last week. Hi, Lauren. And I gave Lauren a gift last week. You're welcome to set it down there. Uh, she got to open it, and, and Lauren, so you took the gift home, did you? Yes. Good. Did you play with it? Yeah. You did. Do you have a brother? Yes. Did he play with it? Yeah. All right. And did you like it? Yeah, it was fun. Good. And your parents, they said, we want you to keep this and play it every day for the rest of your life. They didn't say that. That's interesting. No. I thought they might not say that. Now, we had an appointment last week, and the appointment was that you and I would come back here, and you would have to re-gift either that gift or another gift like it. So I see you've brought a gift with you. I don't want you to tell me what it is, but you're ready to re-gift it? Yeah. So what are you thinking about re-gifting? Do you like that concept? Um, it's tough, but... Uh... <laughs> it's tough if you got a good gift. Yeah. If you didn't get a good gift, it's not that tough, you know. <laughs> but that was a good gift, wasn't it? It's harder re-gifting when you get it I would be fine gifting um, the Nintendo Switch, but it's hard when you play with it first. I see. Oh, okay. Then it kind of gets into you. That's a very wise comment. Okay, very good. Well, we have someone else we're going to meet here this morning, Lauren, and that's Valentino Corrales. Goes by Val. Okay, Val, here you come. Very good. We're glad to have Valentino here today. And what I'm going to do with Valentino is the same thing, Lauren, that I did with you. We're going to let him open the gift. We'll let him see what it is that he's got here. And then he's going to have to make a decision. Come here, Valentino. How are you this morning? Good. You doing well? Mm-hmm. You know what season of the year this is? Christmas time. Christmas. Absolutely right. Do you like Christmas? Yes, I like it a lot. A lot, huh? Mm-hmm. What do you like about Christmas? Well, it's the spirit of giving and celebrating the birth of Jesus. That's perfect. That's a very good answer, especially in church. That's a great answer. Now, are you thinking about what you're going to be giving people this year? Mm-hmm. Mom and friends and family members, you got all that, pastor, all that, you've got everybody you're giving gifts to? think so. Pretty much, I think so. Okay, very good. Well, we have a gift for you today. Now, do you, you've heard of this concept called re-gifting, right? Yes. All right. Can you, can you tell these good folk out here what re-gifting is? Re-gifting is giving something to someone in the need of something that they really need. That they really need. That was given to you, right? Mm-hmm. You think, now Lauren said re-gifting is hard in some cases and easier in others. Do you think re-gifting is easy or hard? A little hard. A little hard. What makes it hard? By choosing a gift that um, you give to someone. Ah, so if it's a gift you like, is that easy or hard? A little hard because you have to think of who is giving the gift. Ah, very good. Well, this is the gift we have for you today, Lauren. So I want you to maybe, I'm sorry, Val, maybe, Lauren, you can help him with some of the paper there. So you pull the paper out. You give that to Lauren. Let's see what's down in there. Aha, I see what's down there. Why don't you pull that out? 
Very nice, a Nintendo Switch. That's, I have discovered that that's a very popular gift. People love, kids love, maybe I should say, and dads, Nintendo Switches. So you're going to be able to take that home, and here's what I'd like you to do, Val. I'd like you to take it home, I'd like you to take it out, I'd like you to play with it, I'd like you to enjoy it, and then I want to meet you back here next Sabbath. Will you meet me here? Yes. All right. And I want you to bring a gift. It doesn't have to be this gift, but it needs to be, it can be, but it needs to be a gift. Are you up for that? Yes. All right. There's Very something good. else in there, too. There's though. something, okay. We'll tell what. Oh, my goodness, there is something else in there. Yeah, pull that out. Oh, okay, look at this. Wait, 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 wait. I think this is what you're talking about, right? <laughs> okay, you got a lot of stuff, so let me help you hold some of this. You need to look at that right there. No, 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 this one right here. There you go. <laughs> All right, here we go. There we go. So that's, you've added to it. And this is called, can I pull the, the, the bow off of it? Restart, lose your memory, find your life. Wow. All right. Lauren, you're the woman. That'll be very good. That'll help Val a lot this coming week. So I... I really hope, though, that you don't lose your memory about meeting me here next week, okay? So just don't, don't forget that, because that'll be very important. So you can put all that back in there, and Lauren, you can put the paper back in there. And I want to say thank you to both of you very much. Lauren, thank you for the gift, and Val, we'll see you next week. Okay. Yeah, you can take it with you. All right, blessings. Thank you very much to both of you. So I've been learning from the kids these last three weeks, learning about regifting, and I agree with some of what was said here today. Regifting is not hard if the gift isn't that good, but if the gift is good, it gets a lot harder. In fact, I've tried to put myself in their mindset and thinking, if I got that particular gift, a Nintendo Switch, I understand it's a really good gift. If I got that gift and I really liked it, what would I bring back the next week? And I thought, well, I'd bring something really good, like a really nice baseball or a really nice golf ball or something. It's, it, it's brand new. But would I give the Nintendos? And then I remember, oh, yeah, they're watching. So I probably would do it. Regifting is not always easy. The cultural concept, as you know, is to regift what you don't want. But we've been noticing that the spiritual concept is to regift the best thing you've ever received. I wonder at Christmas, what might be among the best gifts you've ever received? I want to suggest a gift to you today that is life-changing. May, it may be underlined by something that John Stott said. Many of you are familiar with the name John Stott. John Stott was one of the most keen theological minds, certainly of the 20th century, maybe of any century. In fact, in 2005, Time magazine voted John Stott one of the hundred most influential people on the planet. Some of you will remember, we had the distinct and singular privilege of hosting Dr. Stott here at our church. He came and spoke to us. It was a memorable experience. So John Stott, writing about his location in London, wrote about two buildings, two domes, and he wrote about what is seen on the top of those two domes. So we're going to put those on the screen so that you can look at them. The two domes are one, St. Paul's Cathedral, and two is Old Bailey, which is the criminal courts building. So as you're looking at this right here, you see in the foreground Old Bailey, and on the top of the dome of Old Bailey is Justice holding the scales in her hand. But if you look in the background on the left side, you can see another dome and another figure pointing up toward the sky. This is St. Paul's Cathedral. And on St. Paul's Cathedral, at the top, is a golden cross. If you get lined up just right, you can see both of these domes and the figures on them back to back. So with those domes and their symbols on them in mind, I want to read you the words of Stott. Stott said this, Crossing Waterloo Bridge and looking northeast, 
One has a fine view of the city skyline, and in particular of those two domed buildings, the Old Bailey, the Central Criminal Court, and St. Paul's Cathedral, the Mother Church. At the pinnacle of each dome is mounted a significant symbol. At the top of the Old Bailey stands the classic God of justice, blindfolded for impartiality, wielding the sword of justice in her right hand, holding a pair of scales for the sifting of evidence in the left. At the top of St. Paul's, however, is a great golden cross. Many people think Christianity is a religion of the scales. They imagine that every time they sin, God flicks that sin into one pan, while every time they do a good deed, He flicks it into the other. And they're hoping against hope that the scales may just tip down in their favor. But no. Christianity is not a religion of scales, but of the cross. For if the scales stand for our unfinished works, the cross stands for the finished work of Christ. It tells us Christ died for our sins once for all, that we are forgiven. It invites us to come to Christ saying, nothing in my hand I bring. And so Stott said, standing there on Waterloo Bridge, you can see two symbols jutting into the sky. The scale. And by the way, Stott is right. Many have thought Christianity is a religion of the scales. Do more good than bad, and you're in good shape. In fact, one no less than the great boxer Muhammad Ali, in a classic statement, underlined the reality of that approach to religious faith. In an interview, he was asked, and I want to read you his answer. Ali said this, One day we're all going to die, and God is going to judge our good deeds and bad deeds. If the bad outweighs the good, you go to hell. If the good outweighs the bad, you go to heaven. Classic statement of a religion of scale. Just make sure you do more good than bad, and all is good. But otherwise, you're in trouble. Stott said that's one approach. But then jutting into the sky at a higher level is the dome of St. Paul's perched atop which is that symbol of the finished work of Christ of the fact that we are not a religion of the scales, but a religion of the cross. I had a great conversation, a lot of it through text. My good friend Larry Thomas, just in the last couple of days, and we were texting back and forth about this reality, and he shared with me, if Ali made a classic statement about the religion of the scales, then Rico Tice made a classic statement about the religion of the cross. Rico Tice is associate minister, evangelist at All Souls Church, Langham Place in London, where John Stott had been rector. Tice captures the essence of the religion of the cross in this simple statement. Tice says, the world says, do, do, do. Jesus says, done, done, done. That's the religion of the cross. And that's what came to us at Christmas time. Greatest gift. A religion that says, I will do what needs to be done, and you can receive it, and you can stand in the forgiving grace of God. So if you came into worship this morning, inwardly bowed and bowed, inwardly weighted down, stooped under a burden of guilt, then let me just say to you, it's Christmas. There's good news. To quote Stott in the statement we read, three words, you are forgiven. The fact that Jesus came to save us, to forgive us, is underlined in both of the Gospels that tell the account of His birth. 
Of all the books, of all the chapters in Scripture, in fact, of all four Gospels, only two Gospel writers tell us the stories that happened at the birth of Jesus, Matthew and Luke, the only two. So I'm going to draw just a piece from one and a piece from the other to underline the nature of what happened at Christmas. So first of all, we go to Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. And we find Mary, Mary listening to the angel and what the angel is saying to her. And this is key to what the angel says. Matthew 1, verse 21, she will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Save his people from their sins. Religion of the cross, standing high above the wrecks of time. Done, done, done. And then Luke. We walk out into the field, out to those shepherds, the nip of the cold night, taking our breath away. But that's not all that takes our breath away. Because we hear a word from the angel to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 10. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Matthew's gospel, he will save his people from their sins. Luke's gospel, a Savior has been born. A Savior that brings to you a message of reconciliation with God, a message of forgiveness. So let there be no question. No question about the fact that whatever condition you brought with you today, God forgives. It may be something in the long distant past, something with which you have struggled for many years. If that's the case, then remember the man who struggled in such a way, who in a dream appeared before God. And God asked him, why so downcast? And he told him what had happened and how he had, in spite of his request for forgiveness, had continued to struggle with it. And God says, why would you struggle? And the man said, because I feared what you would think of what I did. And God said, I don't remember what you did. In fact, I distinctly remember forgetting that. It may be something you've struggled with in the long past. Today the word is, you are forgiven. Or it may be this week. You messed up. You blew it flat on your face in the mud. You're still feeling the shame of that. Message to you? Forgiven. You come to church at Christmas time to know the Savior is born. He will save His people from their sins. But there's a problem. Because as you came in the door, somebody stuck a bulletin in your hand. You looked at the front cover of the bulletin and you saw that word, regifting. The sophisticated and classy art of regifting you saw on the bulletin cover. First thought that went through your mind was, I didn't know regifting was sophisticated and classy. I thought it was a little trashy, to be honest with you. Well, but we're at church, and we're talking about good gifts. Now you're realizing I am to take that gift and regift it. That could be a problem. I remember. I remember. I didn't like the story. I remember reading the story. This was years ago, back in the days when the IRA was bombing, when Northern Ireland was in the grip of terrorism and anger and bloodshed. I still remember reading the story of the bomb that exploded, a father and his adult daughter affected by the bomb dramatically. He discovered there at the scene that she had died. Within moments, this father said, I forgive them. And I read that, and I thought, that's not me. 
No, 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 no. That is superhuman. Someone either has something I don't have or someone's in denial. How can you re-gift something so huge in such an act? But we're suggesting that re-gifting of our best gifts is that to which God calls us. So I want to take you to one other biblical passage, this one in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians is my favorite Pauline letter. Favorite Pauline, well, maybe except for Romans. And 2 Timothy. And 1 Thessalonians is really good as well. But for this morning, Ephesians is my favorite Pauline epistle. Because he starts the epistle, spends half of the epistle telling them what they have received in Christ. In fact, I think you can summarize the whole half, first half of Ephesians, by simply saying, you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You are rich beyond imagination. And part of those riches is what he says right at the beginning of the epistle, that we have in him the forgiveness of sins. Forgiven. Stop carrying it around. He's lifted the burden. But then Paul had to go and write the second half. And in the second half, he starts talking about how to live out the first half. And it is in that context that we come to these two verses. Simple, but not easy. Chapter 4, Ephesians 4, starting with verse 31. Get rid of, Paul begins, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That first verse, a lot of us understand that verse, if we're living a life where we have not re-gifted what has been gifted to us, we tend to live with those realities. Things like bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander and malice. Those things become a part of our everyday lives. Those are the emotionally negative realities that are deadly to relationships. Deadly. You have someone one in your life who you could say, our relationship is characterized by these things, bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, malice. It's deadly to relationship. I would dare say that those kinds of emotional experience, experiences are often due to the fact that something has gotten clogged up between the act of receiving forgiveness and re-gifting it. And when it gets clogged up and doesn't find a way to flow, it can be as spiritually deadly as clogged arteries are physically deadly. So if you have that in your life, if you look at your marriage, your roommate relationship, situation of tension with a colleague at work, a lot of talking behind each other's backs. A lot of anger. A lot of eruptions because that's what one of the words means. Just eruptions, eruptions. If a lot of that is going on, the second verse that we read is the simple, don't read that as being easy, is the simple but not easy answer. Be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. It's one thing to hear the Christmas message, you are forgiven. It's another thing to hear the Christmas re-gifting message, now you go and forgive. That's a lot harder. In fact, you may say, wait a minute, Randy, do you know what he did to me? Do you know how she damaged me? I understand. 
Forgiveness is something we need every day of our lives. In fact, I have told premarital couples, if you don't know how to forgive, you will not succeed in marriage. Because one thing I can guarantee you, marriage will need healthy doses of forgiveness. It just will. That's the reality. So we suffer the bumps and the bruises of life. A spouse is late and we miss our dinner reservation. A colleague misses something and we have to stay an hour after work to get it done. Somebody cuts us off on the freeway and we slam on the brakes and swerve. That's life. It's one thing to forgive those kinds of things. But what about those deeper pains? What about that? A spouse who cheated on you. A colleague who stole your research. A roommate who has spread vicious and untrue rumors about you, damaging you deeply. What about that? Maybe something we need to do is recognize what forgiveness is not. What forgiveness is not. Two or three things. Forgiveness is not excusing behavior. Oh, no, I know you didn't mean it. Truth is, they may have exactly meant it. It's not excusing behavior. It's not minimizing behavior. Oh, it wasn't really that big a deal. It was a big deal. It has wounded and injured me deeply. It's not glossing it over. Oh, give it a little time. It'll pass. No, no, no. It will not pass. It will continue to stew inside of me. And it will bring forth a harvest of bitterness. Forgiveness is not excusing. It's not minimizing. It's not glossing over. Forgiveness is being able to say with truth and honesty that wounded me. It wounded me deeply. It damaged some important parts of me. But I'm making the choice to release you from the emotional debt it feels like you owe me. You are forgiven. Listen to this. The text says, forgive just as God in Christ forgave you. So how did God forgive? Did God gloss over the pain of the relational rupture between divinity and humanity? Did God say to a wayward race, oh, it's not that big a deal, it'll pass? Did God gloss it over, hoping people would forget? Or did God wrap himself in human flesh and come down the starry stair steps of the sky and subject himself to whatever humanity might wish to do him just to be able to look us in the eye and say, despite the pain, I love you and will forgive you. That's how God in Christ forgave. So if it's a deep wound and a blithe answer, don't trust it. Whether you're making the statement or someone else is. Because a deep wound deserves deep repentance and deep forgiveness. It's the greatest gift I can imagine. God bestowing upon us. And now he says... Freely you have received, freely give. So maybe that deserves a story. Maybe that deserves a fable. The words were penned by the late and, in my view, great Lewis Smedes. Lewis Smedes was, as I've mentioned before, professor down at Fuller Theological Seminary. He was a scholar of Dutch extraction, and so when he penned the fable called The Magic Eyes, he said it in the Netherlands. The key figure is a man named Folk, F-O-U-K-E. 
who according to my trusty Google pronunciation guide is pronounced folk. If it's not pronounced that way, don't tell me. <laughs> so here's the fable from the pen of Lewis Smedes. In the village of Fakin, in innermost Friesland, there lived a long, thin baker named Folk, a righteous man, with a long, thin chin and a long, thin nose. Folk was so upright, he seemed to spray righteousness from his thin lips over everyone that came near him, so the people of Fakin preferred to stay away. Folk's wife, Hilda, was short and round. Her arms were round. Her bosom was round. Her rump was round. Hilda did not keep people at bay with righteousness. Her soft roundedness seemed to invite them instead to come close to her in order to share the warm cheer of her open heart. Hilda respected her righteous husband and loved him, too, as much as he allowed her. But her heart ached for something more from him than his worthy righteousness. And there, in the bed of her need, lay the seed of sadness. One morning, having worked since dawn to knead his bread for his dough for the ovens, folk came home and found a stranger in his bedroom lying on his, Hilda's round bosom. Hilda's adultery soon became the talk of the tavern and the scandal of the Fakin congregation. Everyone assumed that folk would cast Hilda out of his house, so righteous was he. But he surprised everyone by keeping Hilda as his wife saying he forgave her as the good book said he should. In his heart of hearts, however, folk could not forgive Hilda for bringing shame to his name. Whenever he thought about her, his feelings toward her were angry and hard. He despised her as if she were a common whore. When it came right down to it, he hated her for betraying him after he had been so good and so faithful a husband to her. He only pretended to forgive Hilda so he could punish her with his righteous mercy. But folks, fakery, did not sit well in heaven. So each time that folk would feel his secret hate toward Hilda, an angel came to him and dropped a small pebble, hardly the size of a shirt button, into folk's heart. Each time a pebble dropped, folk would feel a stab of pain, like the pain he felt the moment he came on Hilda, feeding her hungry heart from a stranger's larder. Thus he hated her the more. His hate brought him pain, and his pain made him hate. And the pebbles multiplied. And folk's heart grew very heavy with the weight of them, so heavy that the top half of his body bent far forward so far that he had to strain his neck upward to see where he was going. Weary with hurt, folk began to wish he were dead. The angel who dropped the pebbles into his heart came to folk one night and told him, you can be healed of your hurt. There was one remedy, said the angel, only one, for the hurt of a wounded heart. Folk would need the miracle of the magic eyes. He would need eyes that could look back to the beginning of his hurt and see Hilda not as a wife who betrayed him, but as a weak person who needed him. Only a new way of looking at things through the magic eyes could heal the hurt flowing from the wounds of yesterday. But folk protested. Nothing can change the past, he said. Hilda is guilty, a fact that not even an angel can change. Yes, Poor hurting man, yes, you are right, said the angel. You cannot change the past. You can only heal the hurt that comes to you from the past. And you can heal it only with the vision 
of the magic eyes. And how can I get your magic eyes? Folk pouted. Only ask, desiring as you ask, and they will be given you. And each time you see Hilda through your new eyes, one pebble will be lifted from your aching heart. Folk could not ask it once, for he had grown to love his hatred. But the pain of his heart finally drove him to want, and then to ask for the magic eyes that the angel had promised. So he asked, and the angel gave. Soon Hilda began to change in front of folks' eyes, wonderfully, mysteriously. He began to see her as a needy woman who loved him instead of a wicked woman who had betrayed him. The angel kept his promise. He lifted the pebbles from folks' heart one by one, though it took a long time to take them all away. Folk gradually felt his heart grow lighter. He began to walk straight again. And somehow his nose and chin seemed less thin and sharp than before. He invited Hilda to come into his heart again. And she came. And together they began again a journey into their second season of humble joy. Is your heart heavy? Is your heart hard? Do you walk stooped by a load? It's Christmas. So I say to you, you are forgiven. God is not angry with you. He extends to you what may be the greatest gift you can ever receive. But then he says, it's Christmas. It's the season of regifting. And so he says to you, take that forgiveness. Wrap it in your humility and love. And hand it to that person who has wounded you. And the angel will begin to lift the pebbles from your heart. There is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior. He will save His people from their sins. So be kind, compassionate, forgiving one another just as Christ in God has forgiven you. Amen. To give away, but the last thing on your mind today, it always goes to those who don't deserve. It's the opposite of how you feel when the pain that causes just too real it takes everything you have to say the word forgiveness. Forgiveness. It 
Flies in the face of all your pride It moves away the mad inside It always angers own worst enemy Even when the jury and the judge say You got a right to hold a grudge Is the whisper in your ear saying Let it free Forgiveness 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 Show me how to love the unlovable Show me how to reach the unreachable Help me now to do the impossible Forgiveness 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 It'll clear the bitterness away It can even set a prisoner free There is no end to what its power can do So let it go and be amazed What you see through eyes of grace, the prisoner that it really frees is you. Forgiveness. 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 Show me how. To love the unlovable, show me how to reach the unreachable, help me now to do the impossible, forgiveness, I want to finally set it free, show me how to see what your mercy see, help me now to give what you gave to me. Forgiveness. Gracious God, from the deepest parts of our soul, we thank you for your forgiveness. And Lord, we just cling to you, asking that you would give us the grace, the humility, and the spiritual strength to re-gift that forgiveness to those who need it most. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Hello, everybody. What a happy season of the year, at least for most of us. And I'm glad to welcome you today. And I just have a couple of notes. Uh, number one, as we're planning for a new year, 2020, we want to work ahead as far as we can with our greetings. So we welcome your requests for birthdays, anniversaries, special events, and the pictures. Please include pictures for us so that we can let everybody know who is celebrating. And the second note, some people say, we, we missed your greetings. Let me tell you how you can always catch our greetings. Have somebody help you know about YouTube and Roku and the Loma Linda University Church's services are there and our greetings will follow second service every week. So we don't want you to miss out and we're sorry about those times you have missed. Right at the top of my list today is a dear, dear friend of longstanding, Kelly Bach. And many of you are gonna know Kelly because he's been a teacher across the land over his years and now he's here with us in Loma Linda having a birthday. Hello, Kelly. So glad to be connected with you and I wish you the very best. Trace Salerno, many of you know that name from other places as well. Trace Salerno happens to be my grand nephew and I am so grateful every time I get to be in touch with him and his precious family. Congratulations, Trace, on another birthday. Michelle and Scott Cady, up in Boise, Idaho area, but I've known them a while as they're marking their 29th wedding anniversary, and I had the privilege of standing up with Michelle and Scott those years ago. What can I say about this next gentleman, Stu Harty? You see him every Sabbath here at Loma Linda University Church, bringing announcements and greetings. I've had the privilege of knowing him and working with him a long, long time. And his family is very, very special to me. So congratulations, Stu, on your birthday and love to the Hardy family. Hello, Brandon Wolf. You are a special part of this Loma Linda University Church family, as well as being a part of the Wolf family. And I'm glad to congratulate you, Brandon, for your 19th birthday and let everybody know that you are a huge help and leader here at Loma Linda University Church. Hello, Linda Graham, all the way over there in Essex, England. Oh, we're so glad you're a part of our Loma Linda family and you join us from Sabbath to Sabbath. And now, Linda, you're having a birthday also. And I am here with your friends at Loma Linda to congratulate you. Judy Vidella, hello, Judy. You and Gabe have been good friends of mine for a long, long time. Out there in Thousand Oaks, that's where we first got acquainted. And now to know it's your birthday, Judy, I'm here to say happy birthday. Martha Squire, Mayaguez, Puerto Rico. Having another birthday, Martha. And I want to wish you the very best. And with that man in your life, Richard, with whom you are marking 39 years of marriage. Congratulations, I love this picture. Back to that wedding day. Dr. John Scharfenberg known across the land and beyond this land where you have been working in Eastern Europe and other places for years, John. Your life is a testimony of the best values and principles of health. And I want to congratulate you on 96 years, near 96th birthday, John. Congratulations. Hello, Bill Gerber up there in Abbotsford, British Columbia, a part of the Hope Campground. I know you're the leader there, and I know also you're having a birthday. I congratulate you, Bill, and glad to see you there with dear Bonnie. Hello, Herb Fevick, up in Gresham, Oregon, 
at the village. Been there lots of times, many dear friends there, and I'm so glad to see this picture of you and Ruth, Herb, as you mark your 92nd birthday. Congratulations. Michael Patterson, another one of the sons of the Loma Linda University Church, and you do us so proud, Michael, with your wonderful music, and we welcome you home whenever we can, but we've had to let you go over there in Maryland now as you're a music leader. Congratulations on your birthday, Michael. Pedro Payne, right here at Loma Linda, in charge of the Possibilities Program that gives a new life to so many people, and now you're marking, I think it's your 55th birthday. Congratulations, Pedro. Hello, Margaret Yana Gehera, right here at the Villa. And I'm so glad for our Villa family and glad to know you're having a birthday, Margaret, and I congratulate you. Olympia Boyd, Brooklyn, New York. And because you have friends who love you, Olympia, I get to find out about your birthday and get to congratulate you today. Hello, Leroy Wyatt, all the way over there in Shadron, Nebraska. Glad to know about you folks and have you a part of our own Loma Linda University Church family. And now to say happy birthday, Leroy. Bill Shesky, Dr. Shesky, also a part of the Villa family. But you've been a part of this Loma Linda family for a long time. And now I get to congratulate you for your 95th birthday, I'm told. Warmest congratulations, Dr. Shasky. Willard Beeman, I was so glad to see you the other day and be reminded of our history. For those of you who might not know, Willard and I used to work in evangelism together, and now he lives at the villa and is having his 94th birthday. Congratulations, man. And best greetings to all the rest of us as we enjoy this special season. Mm -hmm.